For those of you who are just walking back into the room, we're switching it back up to the Opportunity and Global Impact track. Next up, we will hear from Mario Havel, and he will be sharing what he has learned from building a parallel economy using Ethereum. Before I introduce Mario, do we have friends in the audience from Central Europe today? Raise your hands, Central Europe. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, Mario is someone I've had the great pleasure of hanging out with and also learning from. He is a protocol supporter and researcher working with the Ethereum Foundation, co-founder of the Bordel Hackerspace. A bit louder. <laughs> um, Mario has been building and educating local communities in Bratislava, Prague, Barcelona, inspired many people to live crypto native and contribute to the free and open source software uh, ecosystems. Please join me in welcoming Mario. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, I'm excited there is so many friends from Central Europe here. Because so um, what I'm planning to do here today is actually to share a bit of experience from Central Europe, uh, experience of building local parallel police. So the name of the talk in the, in the um, uh, schedule is Building Parallel Economy, but uh, that's too narrow. Uh, topic and it will be actually uh, more about parallel society, parallel structures in general. So, um, yeah, so th that's the first question, I guess. What is this parallel society? What are these parallel structures I'm talking about? And um, yeah, let's see where it, where it leads. <laughs> so, first of all, to, to somehow define, somehow explain what, is, what are the parallel societies, um, let's talk a bit about theory of social change. I believe that many people in the world, but especially all of you folks here, have ideas how to make the world better, uh, how to improve societies, how to make uh, betterment for everybody. Because, well, there are many issues in the current society, in the governments, in the, in the cultures, and um, there, are, there are a bunch of utopias, but especially there are various ways how to achieve the change, how to achieve this improvement. Um, uh, and I will very oversimplify the social change theory. I'm very sorry about that. But uh, to sum it up, uh, we have some top-down approach uh, to changing society, which is uh, we can imagine some politician creating uh, better rules which will improve the life. Um, we have, uh, or like also I vote, right? I'm giving my voice to, to somebody speaking for me. So, so um, uh, he has uh, he has then the top-down power. Um, the bottom-up approach coming from communities, coming from people, from activists, whether it's entrepreneurial, uh, non-profit activism, and uh, uh, people actually uh, building projects which are ch permissionlessly changing the world. And uh, uh, within the social change, I also have to, have to mention uh, revolutions, which are another maybe kind of sudden uh, kind of change in society. I hope you can see the slides through me, actually. Um, yeah, nice. And um, I mean, we can argue about many issues of these of these uh, of these approaches. Uh, first of all, um, there is uh, there is a, the, the violence uh, involved, uh, especially in the top-down approach. Uh, when we have government enforcing rules, it uh, requires coercion. Um, also, revolution can be can be kind of violent, <laughs> and uh, there might be hidden violence even some uh, in some bottom-up approaches. So that's that's one of the critique. And the second thing is effectiveness of these of of various approaches to social change, and the effectiveness in the terms of uh, social context, I would say. So the problem with uh, for example, the top-down approach is that the politician or somebody who is creating these rules for us needs to follow the zeitgeist of society, the zeitgeist of society, the, 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 the social context. Uh, for example, the politician in very conservative country cannot make very lib liberal reforms, right? So he always needs to follow what the electorate wa wants. But also in the bottom-up uh, systems, uh, we are limited by the social context in multiple ways. Uh, like uh, when I'm when when you are creating a movement which is too outside of the the Overton window, uh, it's hard to gain traction. And uh, 
and uh, you might be even you know out to censor it and um, uh, uh, also in the in the in the activism uh, we see uh, we see these uh, limits where I'm putting my productive energy uh, to something I believe in, but it might be used completely differently in the current social context. So, for example, I'm uh, building some open source tools. I'm contributing to to some open source ecosystem, and uh, now government takes this takes this open uh, open program and uses it for an army, for example. So, I'm I've actually contributed to something I didn't uh, want it at all. So, yeah, so we can argue about like effectiveness and issues with the social change, uh, but the, the main issue here, or what I want to mention is that none of these work in totalitarian regimes. So, in the in uh, authoritarian regime where you, well, cannot freely vote, so the top-down doesn't work at all, you don't have freedom of expression, you, people cannot uh, cannot do any forms of activism, this is, this is not possible. And so what would I like to share here is uh, the experience from Czechoslovakia, which experienced uh, decades of totalitarianism after the communist regime, which started after Second World War. And in late 60s, uh, there was a kind of a liberal wave uh, in, the, in the socialist communist run uh, Czechoslovakia, which uh, argued for opening borders so people can actually travel to the West, for example, um, argued for certain free market principles and, and so on and so on. And of course, uh, the big Soviet brother didn't like that. And um, uh, as a part of the Eastern Bloc, uh, it, was, it was something which was very discouraged and uh, it resulted in invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. And uh, yes, yeah, so the Warsaw Pact, the, the Soviets just sent tanks. And well, compared to Ukraine these days, uh, Czechoslovakia was not able to fight back. So for coming years, uh, it experienced strong uh, uh, Soviet-run communist totali totali ah, damn it, authoritarian regime. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, especially in the 70s, in the coming years, there was era of so-called normalization, which was a wave of a strong totalitarianism. And this, this resulted in, uh, in intellectuals, in people, in scientists, in artists being persecuted, being uh, forced to uh, become just workforce, not the intellectuals, and, uh, and uh, people were persecuted, uh, spied on. And uh, of course, this kind of totalitarianism results in some opposition, in some dissident movement. And um, there was, so around the whole Eastern Bloc, there were many interesting and, and uh, courageous um, uh, dissident movements. And in Czechoslovakia, there was also uh, various of them, for example, like Second Culture, which was, for example, folk, folk singers, um, artists, like, um, uh, 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 but, uh, but one, important, one important and probably the best renowned dissident movement from, uh, from Czech, Re Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia that I need to mention is Charter 77. And uh, Charta or Charter 77 was, um, well, uh, it was a collection of essays. It was petition which was appealing uh, to government. So it starts to comply with basically what it promised <laughs> with, uh, of, um, to stop violating human rights, uh, civic rights. Um, and uh, as peaceful as, as uh, humanitarian this, this uh, uh, this movement was the government really took it back. Uh, government started to uh, uh, chase people behind Charter 77 and and uh, publicly uh, destroyed uh, destroying their figures. And uh, uh, basically, uh, it was yeah. So th there are there are many interesting people on this picture. You might know on the very left. Uh, Václav Havel, who later became the first president of Czech Republic, and he's world-renowned humanitarian, uh, liberal, and um, uh, so the charter. It was a collection of essays. It has had few spokesmen, and uh, uh, one of the one of the colleagues of Václav Havel, one of the one of the leading uh, personas in Charter 77, on the right here was Václav Benda. And he, uh, within, within this dissident movement, he actually focused on um, exploring how is the movement itself evolving, how, it's, how, it's, how it reacts to the persecution from government. And uh, he uh, described it as uh, parallel police. Uh, he, he noticed that this 
counterculture, this persecuted uh, subculture or, or movement is building pro structures, its own culture, its own uh, uh, education. Right? We had there was there was many books which were just prohibited, and these were distributed, uh, you know, hand rewritten uh, within these communities. So he described it as. as yeah, as parallel polis, and and um, he and parallel parallel polis in original or parallel polis could be defined as set of strategies um, for uh, creating some independent society. Uh, this is this is outside of the context. This this big uh, big uh, uh, quote here by Erby Fuller, but it kind of kind of uh, sums up the idea uh, that I have there. Uh, basically, let's. When, when I'm in the society like the communist regime, right, I cannot fight against it. Uh, we cannot have uh, protests because we will be violently punished. We don't have any freedom of expression. We cannot write freely. We cannot, there is only a single party, the communist party, we can vote. We cannot change anything. So we are forced to uh, building free, independent, parallel structures. And, um, and uh, it's also, it's not just uh, like out of a necessity, but I believe that it's, uh, also effective and moral approach. Uh, this, this, this is something similar to what Gandhi says, right? Uh, be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, parallel police uh, is, to me, a set of strategies, set of um, various parallel structures. Uh, and here are some examples. So the pillars of parallel police would be uh, not just uh, the name of the talk is the parallel economy, but here it's just within the context, right? So it's parallel education, uh, parallel economy, parallel, cult, cult, parallel cult, culture, uh, civic rights protection, which was actually uh, the main reason behind the Charter 77, uh, parallel infrastructure, governance systems for these people. And this is not something which is strictly defined, which is uh, like, okay, this is the parallel police, these structures. Uh, it's, these are just examples. It's always uh, based on the circumstances uh, what the independent society actually requires in that moment. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, completely up to you, right, uh, uh, the community, what it, what it needs in that context. And uh, yes, yeah, being about the social context, when I, when I mentioned before, so here is a beautiful thing which Parallopolis enables, and that's uh, actually having these, let's say, design principles uh, rooted in the in the parallel police itself. So when we are building these parallel structures, we are building them on the on the basis of uh, a post positive social context, and we can uh, feel free to put our uh, our uh, uh, productive energy towards uh, parallel police. Czechoslovak dissidents invented. Uh, it's something what Václav Benda described, but I would say it's an uh, anthropological constant throughout the history. Uh, we see people creating parallel structures out of necess necessity throughout the whole history, uh, whether it's Christians who were persecuted in the ancient Rome, or in the, in the m recent history, uh, maybe hippie movement or LGBT and, and similar uh, countercultures uh, ended up actually building their own parallel structures. Okay, now where Ethereum fits in all of this. And um, Ethereum, uh, or like speaking about these technologies, I have to go all the way back to cypherpunk. And um, cypherpunk is another movement which actually uh, comes to life in late 70s and 80s. Um, and this was, a, this was a movement community of various interesting people. Uh, many programmers, scientists, mathematicians, entrepreneurs, uh, people who uh, at a time where internet, uh, computers, and encryption started to spread, um, the governments, well, wanted to fight with it, right? Uh, the, the government said the, uh, the encryption is a weapon. It's something which only army can have, and wanted to limit what people can do with their computers, what uh, can actually happen, um, uh, what, what kind of encryption we can use. And cypherpunks were people who st stood against this, who uh, not just built tools, as it's described here very nicely by Eric Hughes. Um, it's uh, uh, built the tools, but also created um, precedences against, uh, against regulation of cryptography. For example, uh, 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 
Fillmore, who started EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, very renowned until today. And um, so the cypherpunks, uh, so the first part here, it's a, uh, it's a part of a cypherpunk manifesto by, the, by Eric Hughes. Um, and the second part is a manifesto of crypto anarchy, which is a movement coming out from the, uh, uh, growing from the cypherpunk, um, and the manifesto was written by Timothy C. May, uh, the left the guy on the left in the picture, and uh, Timothy May took the idea of the cypherpunk even further, not just to protect ourselves, but to actually achieve freedom through the digital technologies. Uh, it's like 30 years old, it was first distributed on a conference, Crypto 88, in 1988, and I have to say it's very prophetic if you read it, and he's arguing basically about what we see today. I believe that today, when you look at the world, uh, when you look at the digital world, the digital realm is, uh, well, I would say bigger than the physical one. It's maybe even more important. And we can leverage these technologies because the government, the authorities will have the power, the, the coercion power in the physical world, but they are losing it and maybe never really had it in the digital one. And that's thanks to tools of crypto anarchy. The crypto is a bit like something, something ideological, like it's some political, political idea, like anarchism based on crypto. I don't know. Uh, to me, anarchy, uh, crypto anarchism is a set of tools. It's a toolbox which uh, allows for many important things. Generally, I would say that crypto anarchy allows uh, to build, uh, to build human interactions uh, more voluntarily rather than based on coercion. And uh, it comes with many important tools, with uh, tools for um, uh, uh, anonymity on the internet, digital money, uh, <laughs> uh, encryption, and, and privacy, which uh, I believe is the fundamental uh, fundamental uh, 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 building block for freedom. So we have this parallel police, which is a set of strategies for building independent parallel structures, and now we have crypto anarchy, which is a set of tools for building independent communities. Well, it, and it kind of fits together, to, together doesn't it? Um, so there is this lovely building in Prague called Paralanipolis, as you can see, instead of crypto anarchy. And I would say this, this building is actually like the manifestation of the connection between the physical and digital world. and. Um, and this is where it comes together, uh, in the idea that we can build these parallel structures, these independent uh, communities, thanks to the tools of crypto, crypto anarchy. And Parallel Polis has been running for over nine years now, uh, educating about these technologies and experimenting with them. And uh, so in the talk, I would like to actually later explain some, some examples of how we, uh, how we experiment with Ethereum as tool of crypto anarchy for building parallel societies. But but uh, one, one, uh, one uh, piece that got uh, Paralani Police famous is actually this little place, Bordel. And many of you who follow the merch might heard about Bordel WTF, but it's named after actual physical place, which is in basement down there uh, of this building. And the basement is called Bordel, and, and you might know these memes about the Robston merch with the whole Get team, which happened there. So. Uh, the Parallel Polis is like open platform, uh, talking about a specific project, it's open platform for various communities to meet uh, because like when, when various communities, and now I'm talking about the crypto, not just Ethereum, but we have uh, Bitcoiners, Monero people, I have Monero socks here, uh, <laughs> I ha and, uh, and uh, all the people who are actually building privacy tooling and, um, and encryption tooling and artists and so on meet in this place and create beautiful things. So there are, there are a few things we experimented with in Parallel Polis uh, considering Ethereum. So like, um, I, I, I mean, I don't really have to explain this. I believe that you folks who understand Ethereum know that it's such a strong tool for what I explained because it enables permissionless coordination. And uh, I would say it's, uh, it's a cypherpunk, solarpunk, lunarpunk, sagepunk, and pixelpunk tool. Uh, very versatile tool. Um, kind of a, when I have a toolbox uh, in the crypto, of the crypto anarchy tools, Ethereum would be a Swiss knife, which, can, which enables me many things. And these are some of those few important things that we, uh, we use um, uh, in our little experiment with Parallel Polis. And um, first of all, the 
DeFi or the open finance, the permissionless finance which Ethereum enables. This is something which is which is necessity for uh, well, uh, I would say dissidents or for people who are who don't have access to the traditional finance or don't agree with uh, immorality, immorality of the traditional finance and, and uh, want to explore the permissionless alternatives. And Parallelpolis, uh, this building that I showed, accepts only cryptocurrencies for the whole of its existence. There is actually a Bitcoin cafe, it's a place with it's a cafe which accepts only crypto. There is a co-working. There is many people coming to this building and they are forced to pay with crypto. So all the income is actually only in cryptocurrencies. And it's kind of a mess to live crypto natively because of the volatility, because of, uh, uh, because of uh, the bear markets which will come always, right? So uh, thanks to Ethereum, we have tools like stable coins. We have tools like collateralized loans. Uh, so the DeFi here is not about chasing yield farming, but about actually using this to to survive economically in some parallel economy. So, uh, and, um, so, so uh, as an individual who is living without banks, it's, uh, it's a tool which is, which is a necessity uh, to be able to, to survive um, with uh, uh, just crypto. Uh, but also as the organization, as Polis, it's, uh, it's great that we have the tool like loans. And there are, it's not just using the tools, but there are also uh, people coming from Parallelpolis who uh, are creating these tools. There is PWN, Pawn Finance, which is aiming to bring mortgages for crypto natives, for people who don't have or don't want to have, can have access to the uh, traditional finance. Uh, public goods, uh, I also don't have to go deep in those because you folks are here, you understand what public goods meme in Ethereum is. Uh, but uh, it's the realization here, how it clicks it's it's super it's really amazing, right? I mean, we have the the whole the parallel society, the parallel structures, which are mostly all public goods. The whole building that I show, it's non-profit. It's it's public good, which provides education, it provides platform, and and it's a uh, something which needs to be funded not via coercion, via taxes or or, or so on, but um, by uh, but alternatively, regeneratively, and. Um, uh, what we uh, what we experienced is that Paral Polis got uh, 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 got um, successfully uh, crowdfunded multiple projects, uh, not just for itself, but for example, the the other tough COVID winter, uh, Paral Polis took uh, the volunteers from Paral Polis had a truck with Bitcoin coffee on the wheels and provided coffee for doctors uh, fighting the COVID in the hospitals, and this coffee was free for them. It was crowdfunded mostly with Bitcoin and Fiat, not with Ethereum, to be honest, but uh, still the crowdfunding and the, the public good funding in Ethereum tools are much stronger. Parallelpolis accepts donation on Gitcoin, on GiveEat, and um, and uh, generally, if you, we want parallel structures, they need, need um, this kind of funding. Uh, I'm running out of time, but uh, yeah, the governance, uh, uh, another, another important part, uh, we need uh, reputation systems and governance. What we experimented with is, for example, tokens for people who are contributing, for volunteers who uh, get awarded with our own token. And based on this, you can, you can uh, track the contributions in the physical space, right? In the local community, but also in the in the digital one, uh, like example of the digital parallel police would be, for example, the network states. There is Balaji's book about it. Uh, Vitalik has a good article on it, and uh, or like uh, network states or parallel or, or cloud societies or parallel societies. It all sounds the same to me. And this is, these are uh, local or or digital communities which need governance and reputation systems. And Ethereum provides that. Um, uh, uh, Parallelpolis, the specific project in Prague, created these beautiful silver coins or medals as a tribute to uh, to Alan Turing. Uh, the certificate of these is NFT on Ethereum, uh, but also before we uh, uh, there there were uh, coins, silver and even some gold ones with Aaron Swartz, um, Ross Ulbricht. Uh, and, and others, <laughs> and these these had certificate on Bitcoin as a multisig on Bitcoin, so it was kind of legacy technology, but still, uh, this is something which sends crypto weddings were a cool idea, uh, which which almost got materialized in the Slovak version of Parallelpolis in Bratislava, where a lawyer 
uh, was working on basically this parallel kind of wedding where, uh, so as a homosexual, he was fighting for uh, having uh, same-sex marriages, which are not possible in this country, but he created, uh, as a lawyer, he created a, a contracts, peer-to-peer -peer contracts, which enable similar, uh, similar things as uh, having the normal legal marriage. And the certificate of these can be a contract on Ethereum. Um, it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, security system. This was this was a concept which didn't get materialized, but there was a nice, nice, nice idea, a nice concept about having like parallel Uber kind of police based on Ethereum in a way that I have a fountain, I have a physical device in my home, which uh, I fund through a contract. And when you come, you beep your NFC card like you have these uh, these cards with your with your uh, ENS, uh, and you get rewarded by basically securing the perimeter. Um, as a proof of concept of this, uh, we had, uh, there was a bird feeder in Paralpolis, it's a cute project, uh, which does this incentivization for uh, uh, this like, this kind of incentivization for feeding birds. So we have like a bird feeder with a device where you tap your cart, you put their, uh, you put their uh, a bird seed and you get paid from a contract where everybody can some money, right, uh, for, for feeding the birds. So uh, incentive systems and environmental protection, another important thing which uh, uh, Ethereum also helps with uh, in free, independent manner. Uh, there, is a, there is a project which was also funded thanks to quadratic funding, which was an, at ETH Prague in Paralpolis, uh, and the Turtles. And these are folks from Enviro Meetups from Paralpolis, who another piece of community which came and learn about this ecosystem. And these folks are coming to Indonesia, saving turtles. And the thing is that each turtle is unique. They have unique faces, like people. So they make NFTs out of them, and you can adopt them, you can buy them, and support uh, the, actual, the actual protection of the turtles, because it's a lot of work to be on the beach all the time and make sure that they are, they are right. Uh, yeah, good. I think I went through it. Um, and uh, so the motto that we use in Paralpolis is enter the outside. Idea he here is that thanks to these technologies, thanks to these Paral structures, um, we can, uh, I don't want to say opt out. When people often say this opt out from the system, use crypto, you are opting out. But it's not like opting out to some vacuum because you are actually entering something, right? So you enter the Paralpolis, but at the same time, you're entering outside. Uh, and better in English, I like it in Spanish, or check, entra la fuera. So, uh, yeah, enter the outside. I guess, I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Um. I can't believe I made it on time. <laughs> and I'm sure if we have room for some questions. Anybody? Uh, it's, it's all right. Thank you so much for coming, folks. I uh, really appreciate all of you here. Hope you liked it, and I will be around here. You can find me. If you see Masked Anon, it's still me. Uh, just leaked it, but uh, whatever. Yeah, and can, yeah. I, normally, I work in the protocol support. This was totally out of EF stuff, but uh, there is my email. Feel free to contact me or Twitter. Yeah, thank you so much again.